Moms, today is for you. Today we celebrate everything you mean to each and every one of us. You mean the world to us, no matter how your influence came into our lives. No matter if we call you mom, grandmother, aunt, or friend, your motherly influence in our lives has helped shape who we are today. It is your love and care that is often shared through a hot dish or a warm embrace. It is your patience and consistency that is the reason we're able to stand on our own two feet, even through the waves of this life. It is your availability and secure imperfection that keeps us coming back to talk to you time and time again. It is your brave and fierce mama bear spirit that protects us when we are straying from the path of righteousness. It is your wisdom and forgiveness that taught us that stoves are hot and that life will knock us down sometimes. That we can learn that it is okay to be scared and have fear, but that we can also have joy in those times because you taught us that God will pick us back up. You taught us that God will always be there for us and that he will be everything that you lack and more. Thank you for being the caring, patient, consistent, available, secure, brave, fierce, wise, forgiving, instructing, joyful, and loving mom that you are. Yeah, Josh pulled that together this last week. He saw some videos and, and was like, I can do one of those. And so Josh, our youth pastor, did that. So I thought he did really, really well. And a little, little survey that I took earlier is that I discovered that 92% of you have mothers. So this is really quite fitting today that a lot of you can connect to that. No, no, that's not true. Yeah, grateful for our mothers, grateful for the character that we see that comes in our mothers that is a characteristic of God. So we celebrate that characteristic that God shows us in our mothers, even see some mothers with uh, babies back here. Yes, that is awesome. Any babies behind? Not yet, not yet, no? Coming in, in May sometime, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's, so that's awesome. All right, let's all stand together and worship Jesus today. Thankful that you're here. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire, and in darkest nights, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful, all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. With 
my life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Let's receive it now, your goodness. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will see of the goodness of God. Oh, my All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Yes, you are good, Lord. our trust in you. Amazing love that welcomes me, the kindness of mercy that bought with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserving sing to him god you're so good god you're so good god you're so good you're so the cross age to age and hour by hour the dead are raised the sinners saved the work of your power Amen God your soul God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good to me. Sing it again. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're Oh. 
glory of Jesus' name. And should this life bring suffering, Lord, I will remember what Calvary has bought for me both now and forever God you're so good God you're so If I get the reverb, do I sound echoey like him? <laughs> Beautiful and harmonious. If I haven't had the privilege of meeting you before, my name is Nate Kemper. I do not lead us in musical worship. That would be a tragedy for all of us. But I am the lead pastor here. Love that we gather together each week to celebrate Jesus. And we'll continue to do that uh, through song and through giving back to God and through studying God's word together. Before that, I want to remind us of why we exist as a church. We exist to equip people to find life and faith in Christ. And I believe we do that best as we uh, connect with each other, as we grow in our own relationship with Christ and encourage others to do the same. And as we participate in what God is doing in our lives and in the world around us. There's a number of different opportunities to do that, connecting, growing, and participating. Most of them can be found in your bulletin. If you're engaging with us digitally, you can find that uh, bulletin under the resources tab of our website as well. But want to let you know of some of those opportunities as they're coming up. If you're looking to connect with other people, our Let's Fish Fishing League that's getting started this year has had great response so far. We've already got 18 different boats signed up, over 30 people signed up. If you have a boat and you want to be added to that list, or if you want to join on to one of those boats, make sure you put your name on the sign-up sheet on the Let's Fish table in the back, and Pastor Nathan will follow up with you about that. We're excited about that Tuesday nights at the end of May and beginning of June as that begins to take place. We've got a volunteer brunch coming up in two weeks, so if you are a volunteer or you've been blessed or served by any of our volunteers, we're going to spend some time together connecting, eating food, celebrating the work that God has done in and through our volunteers in the last season of ministry. It's a free brunch two weeks from today on May 22nd, so all of you are available to come before the service for that. We'd love to have you join us and connect with that. A couple other just administrative details to be aware of. The week after that is Memorial Day weekend, and on Memorial Day weekend, we're going to just have one all-church family service together. And so that'll be at 10 o'clock that day. There won't be our normal service times. It'll be one uh, larger service for all of us together there that weekend. We're excited about having all of us in one place for one service together and hope that you'll be there with us for that as well. And then as many of you have hit spring cleaning time uh, in your houses, I just want you to earmark the fact that we're going to have a garage sale in June uh, that will benefit our youth uh, team that's going to the Life Conference. And so you may be going through your house and thinking, I haven't used that in a while and it's taking up space and I'd really like to get rid of it or donate it. Start figuring out what those things are. You'll hear more details as it comes. But June uh, 9th through 11th will be a garage sale. So the couple days before that, we'll have opportunity for people to come drop off stuff that they want to donate for that garage sale as that comes as well. Some uh, sadder news for uh, us as we grieve. Many of you know Jeff and Naomi Price 
in our congregation. Jeff passed away yesterday, late morning, early afternoon. And so if you know Naomi well, uh, reaching out to her with encouragement, praying for her, grieving alongside her, your presence with her will be uh, received well. Um, and then we will make sure that we keep you informed when we have opportunity to celebrate his life together and remember him. So we'll keep you updated, particularly through email um, as we get ready for that. But we'll want to pray for uh, Naomi and her family as they grieve uh, Jeff's passing yesterday afternoon. Today's Mother's Day, and I hope you get to celebrate the moms in your life. I'll get time to celebrate that with a couple of different moms in my life. My wife, who's the mother of my daughter, as well as then my own mom this afternoon as well. And so I hope you have time to celebrate and honor the moms in your life. As a church, we wanted to celebrate the moms in our community. And so as you leave, we've got candy bars available for all of you. I know that I got judged when I went to buy the candy bars. Apparently, I look like the kind of person who would spend that amount of money and buy that many of candy bars for my myself, because they definitely thought that's what I was doing, and I had to clarify that I was not just spending that much money on that many candy bars for just myself, but hope to encourage you with those as a church as you leave. I'll remind you about that near the end of the service as well. And one of the things I know to be true about many moms is even on days that we've gathered and hope that we get to celebrate and honor them, many mothers are still thinking about how they can parent more effectively or find resources that help their families. And so a couple of those moms were like, hey, we're involved um, with this Moms in Prayer initiative, and we want to make that opportunity available and aware to all moms who may want to pray uh, uniquely for their kids or in different ways for their schools or or, uh, for the parenting that goes on in their neighborhoods. And so we're going to watch a short video about that ministry, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about how you can engage with it today. There is hope. I am a mom choosing to rise up, battling for my children to be all God intended them to be, believing every child needs the love and power of a praying mom, and knowing God changes circumstances when I pray. Prayer energizes me, helps me put my fears in proper perspective. It is my most powerful weapon. I choose to gather with other women to pray because each of our kids are worth it. And God says, pray. We battle together for their school to be a safe, engaging place of learning, knowing this generation is under attack. And as we pray, God hears, he intercedes, and lives are changed. We meet for one hour every week, bringing students, teachers, and entire schools before the throne, seeking to know God better through his names, attributes, and character, because the more we know God, the more we experience his peace. Standing on the living and active word of God, asking anything according to his will. We are Moms in Prayer International, where every woman can find a community they can turn to, trust, and pray with. This is our time, our opportunity to rise up and impact the world through prayer. Well, like I said, we have a couple moms in our congregation who have engaged in groups that do just that, that meet together consistently to pray for their kids, that use resources to figure out how to do that better in their own homes. And so if that's something that you're feeling a tug towards, you want to uh, be in community with other moms praying in this way, or you want to find some of those resources, there's a table set up in the lobby, and some of those women will be there to help answer any questions or guide you towards that as is available. And if you're either not a mom or, uh, or you don't know which kids to pray for, our newest addition to the church, uh, Abby Voke had and Noah had their baby yesterday at 5.33 p.m. Uh, Elizabeth Joy Voke was born. She was 8 pounds, 10 ounces, and 21 and a half inches long, eight days overdue. So they were very excited uh, for her to finally arrive. Um, and so you can celebrate and encourage her and Noah as well. And we're excited about that. We're going to continue in worship by giving back to God some of what he's blessed us with. As we do that, if you're new or visiting here, we don't want you to feel any pressure or obligation to give. Though if you do want to join us in worshiping in this way, there's an offering box in the back of the sanctuary. Anybody can give digitally, nowthanalliance.org. There's a give tab there that can walk you through all the instructions on what that looks like. Before we receive those gifts, I want to pray for how God would use them. Would you join me in that? God, we're thankful for what you've given to us, most importantly, the gift of life that you've extended to us through Christ. 
and yet we recognize many other blessings. And so as we take time now to give some of those back to you, we pray that they would be pleasing and acceptable to you as an act of worship, that you would use these gifts to spread your love and to grow your kingdom in a world that could desperately use more of it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
of kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The breach was far too wide. From the far side of the chasm, you had me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside and there at the cross you paid the debt i owed broke my chains freed my soul for the first time i had hope Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into glorious light. You took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood. To glorious life. There is nothing stronger than the wonder working power of the blood. The blood that calls the sons and daughters. We are ransomed by our Father through the blood. Than the wonder working power of the blood, the blood that calls the sons and daughters. We are ransomed by a father through the blood, the blood. Thank you, Jesus. For darkness into glorious light. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood of Glory to His name. 
this last song, I welcome you just to have a seat. Welcome to sing along with us as you get more comfortable with this song. It's a relatively new song for us. Spirit sound, rushing wind, fire of God, fall within, Holy Ghost, breathe on us, we pray. As we repent, turn from sin, revival embers smoldering, breath of God, fan us into Fragrance of heaven, pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out. For hearts that burn with holy fear. Purified faith and deed, finer's fire, strengthen what remains. So we, the church, bear your light, lamp of flame, city bright, king and kingdom come, is what we pray. We need a fresh wind, fragrance of heaven. Jesus, we need you. We need your spirit. Come fill us. Help us 
to declare you as the number one thing in our life that we give attention to. May we be a people that other people give testimony to the goodness and the grace of God that is in us. Help us to become those kind of people, Lord. We need your spirit to become those people. Fill us with you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. As I was growing up and would watch the people around me, there were often times where I felt like I was just living in a, like a national talent show. I was just trying to figure out if I was a winner or a loser when the awards would come out. And so I'd watch people around me in classrooms, and some of them had this ability, and I was always jealous of it. They would take their pen and like spin it around their thumb really fast, and just they were able to do that. And every time I tried to spin my pen around my thumb, it would just fly off onto the floor, hit the kid near me, and I was annoyed and frustrated that I didn't have that gift. Or, or there were times where I saw similarly people that could take a coin and put it on their fingers and move their hands in a way that the coin went up and down their knuckles. And I would try that and the coin would fall and I'd get frustrated that I was losing the worldwide talent show. The one that bothered me the most was all of you that know how to spin a basketball on your finger. Because I can't spin a basketball on my finger. No, how many, no matter how many people have taught me or tried to teach me how or shown me the new technique, it, it's never worked for me. And so there were moments I'd look around and think, I am losing the competition. I do not have the skills to win the awards at the national talent show. And yet I also know at the times that there were other things on the, the other side of that that people looked that I could do, and they maybe thought, well, how does he do that? I can't do that. I go to lots of houses still, and kids will come up to me and hand me their Rubik's Cube to solve for them to make back whole again, because it's not that complicated for me to solve a Rubik's Cube. Or I learned how to juggle a little bit with my hands, more importantly for me, because of playing soccer my whole life, I'm really good at juggling a soccer ball. And so there would be times and seasons where I could take a soccer ball and throw it up in the air and just, with my head, just keep it bouncing up and down for hundreds or two hundreds, just as long as I wanted the ball to bounce on my head, I could have it bouncing on my head. And maybe, maybe one of my favorites is uh, I love playing Tetris on the original Nintendo. My wife would say that, Watching me play Tetris is watch, like watching a fire burn. Like it's just rhythmic and natural the way the pieces all fall into place no matter how fast the screen is going. I've got this natural intuition towards playing Tetris. And there have been people in all of those things that have looked and said, I don't know how he does that. And in those places, I feel like I'm winning the talent show. It's not just silly tricks, though. It comes to all sorts of areas of life. By and large, I would say I'm not somebody who can cook well. And so I'm envious of people who feel really confident and comfortable in the kitchen. It would do nobody good for me to play an instrument or sing in front of us. It is not a skill set that I have or a gift that I have. I'd be booed off or buzzered off the stage really quickly in that version of the talent show. But I can stand comfortably in front of a crowd and present I can recall information generally really well from my memory, photographically or otherwise, in a way that is, at times, people say there's a gift there or a talent there that people are envious of. The reality is, is in a lot of the ways our world operates, we look around and compare ourselves at what we can or can't do and what they seem to be able to do or not do. And we play the game like those skills, those giftings, those things are what matters most. And they determine somehow our identity or our worth. They determine how viewed we are in the society around us. Paul has been writing a letter to the church in Corinth, and as he does so, last week we were in chapter 11 where Paul switches his attention uh, towards what it looks like when the church is gathered together, how we do worship together corporately. And what Paul's about to address is that in Corinth, and maybe often today, some people show up to church and feel like it's a talent show. 
You show up and you're comparing yourself to the people around you saying, oh, they were able to do that and I'm not, so they must be more spiritual than me. And I could never learn how to do that. Did you see that? What Paul's going to address really specifically is the spiritual gifts. Did you see that when that person, God used them to give a word to everybody? Or when that person prayed for healing and then it happened? Or that person seems to be speaking in a unique language? And the people in Corinth, we seem to see, are looking at each other saying, well, if they're able to do that and I'm not, they must have all of the talent. They must have all the spiritual wisdom. They must be better. They've created this system of excelling spiritually that I haven't found yet. Throughout his letter, Paul's been saying, this isn't about success. This isn't about climbing a ladder. This is about how we honor God well in what he's doing. The language we used last week is there aren't supposed to be spiritual soloists. These things aren't given. These spiritual gifts aren't given so that people would turn the attention on themselves or they'd be honored more than everybody else. And that's what's happening, and so Paul wants to address that. He's starting to do that in chapter 12. This is how it begins. It says, Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. Paul's heart, as he begins this section on the spiritual gifts in the church, is to make sure that people are clear, that the information isn't misguided, that they aren't uninformed, that they aren't just guessing, that they aren't just reacting based on what they see and feel, but they have clarity that comes from Paul on it. And so he's going to set up some things for them to establish what the clarity is as it relates to spiritual gifts. He goes on saying, You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. See, in the first century, it was normal in the Greek and Roman world for you to understand that there were lots of gods over lots of different kinds of things. And so if you needed uh, to, you wanted to have a baby, you'd pray to the God of fertility. But if you were starting your garden or your farm, you'd pray to the God of the harvest. And if you were looking for a relationship, you'd pray to the God of love. And if you were going into battle, you'd pray to the God of war. And you went to different places, different idols, different things to get the gift or the skill or the task you needed. And Paul's going to confront that. He says, that's not the way it works. If if you're listening to people and you're trying to decide what the Spirit of God is actually in, if they're cursing Jesus, just narrow them out. The Spirit of God isn't in that. And if they're claiming Jesus is Lord, they can't do that without the Spirit of God. Before we jump into some of those gifts, let me just remind you if you're here. and you claim Jesus is Lord? That's because of the Spirit inside of you. You are indwelt with the Spirit of God. You stating that as a message that comes from the Spirit of God that is inside of you. You've been used by the Spirit to proclaim a truth. Paul makes it clear. No one says Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit of God. It's the Holy Spirit that dwells within us that gives us the ability to do that. And so before we get into some of the gifts that can be unsettling for some or confusing for some, just to know if you have claimed Christ as Lord, You've already been given a message by the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is working in and through you. Paul's going to talk about that, though, more about what the spiritual gifts look like. And so he continues, verse 4. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. You don't go to a different temple to have a baby, then you go to to go to war, then you go to to get provision, then you go to to have the farm grow, then you go to to any other thing you can think of. God, Paul says you need to recognize really clearly there is one God, there is one spirit. He distributes all of the gifts. There are a variety of them, but they all come from the same God. It's not a buffet where you go to get all the different coaches of life that you need to get all the different skills or gifts that you think are beneficial. They all come from one God. Whether that's the gifts or the service or the working, it all comes from the one and same God. And I think the crux of what Paul wants to clarify is verse 7. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Two things that I think are clear in this verse that Paul wants to make known. First, the Spirit of God is for everybody that claims Christ. 
to each one. To each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given. It's available to all of us. God gifts all of us the things we need to work alongside him. That happens in a variety of different ways. We'll talk about that in a moment. But it isn't just for the spiritually elite. It isn't just for the righteous. It isn't just for those who have become pure in some way. It's just as the Spirit wants to distribute them to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given. And then the reason that the gifts come is clear. The gifts of the Spirit is for the common good. It's not to win a talent show. It's not to have the attention drawn on the person who the Spirit has chosen to manifest those gifts through. It's not to display who has arrived spiritually or who's where on the ladder of success. It's always to glorify God and for the common good of believers in the church and the world. Every time, that's the reason. And what I know is as we begin to talk about some of those particular spiritual gifts is that for many of us, there will be a sense of unease, some skepticism about the way these things have played out in churches as we've seen them or as we've heard stories told or as we've navigated it on TV or read about it in our Bibles. There's some question of, is that real? Is that happening? Is that from God? And I think all of that uneasiness that we feel boils down to the fact that we authentically recognize that what Paul says is true, that these gifts are supposed to be used for the common good. And so when we see them and they feel like they're being manipulated for somebody's personal gain, we immediately question their authenticity, and I think we should. Because Paul's clear, these gifts are given for the common good. And so when that guy on TV says, if you'll send me $1,000 and I'll pray the prayer and I've got the gift of healing and I'll send you the cloth that I dip in water and that's what you need. And you think, man, that sounds like he's just trying to make money. You can be appropriately uneasy about that. That doesn't seem like it's just for the common good. Paul makes it clear that's what it's supposed to be. As, as he's then expanding, he starts to talk about what some of those gifts look like. They, there's a list of them. It'll be paraphrased or on the screen. I'll read it a little more fully as I just read it out. It says this. To one there is given the spirit, through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another the message of knowledge by the means of the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another miraculous powers. To another prophecy. To another distinguishing between spirits. To another speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another the interpretation of tongues. It's a list of gifts. It's not an exhaustive list. There are other gifts of the Spirit listed in Scripture as well. Paul even makes other lists in Scripture, in Romans and in Ephesians. And there's a number of places in uh, the other places in Scripture, it talks about what the Spirit offers as a gift. And yet this list, it's called the charismatic gifts, we often look at as the ones that take place in corporate settings with believers. And they take place when the Spirit of God is moving in a moment. And while they aren't the exhaustive list, all, the list mat all of the lists that God gives us matters. These are often a list that gets focused on. And I recognize that we may come from different places of knowledge or experience or comfort with this kind of list of gifts. And so I'm going to ask a question. It's not a rhetorical question. The best way to answer is by raising your hand, and I'll let you know in advance. You might likely raise your hand for more than one of these answers based on seasons of your life, and that's okay. So if you've ever gone through a season of your life where you've just been kind of uneasy or unclear about these spiritual gifts, just raise your hand. Mine's raised. I've been uneasy and unclear about these at times. If you, whether it's been uneasy or not, you've just recognized, I have questions. I've got questions about how these gifts have been used in church history or how they're currently used in the church. You can raise your hand. Similarly, in, uh, but a different question, if you believe that you're fairly confident you've seen or experienced some of these spiritual gifts in a community or worship setting you've been a part of? Raise your hand. Wide varieties of answers. And you may have looked and said, oh, I wish I had been able to say that, or I wish I'd seen or experienced that. There's a wide variety of answers of how we approach these things. 
There's a wide variety of answers of how church history has approached these things. I want to give a couple of just broad def- definition terms and then tell you a little bit about where your church, your denomination, and your pastor land on some of these things. There are some people throughout church history who, as they've read these kinds of things, and then they've walked out an experience that didn't seem to follow some of what Paul's going to talk about in the three chapters in Corinthians and then others in other places, they've said, I don't seem to see those things happening anymore. And maybe that's because, and then they, they read into a belief, maybe they don't need to. Maybe they were helpful for the starting of the church through the disciples and the apostles, so I'm not questioning that they did happen. But as the church has now formed and it has its authority uh, to represent God and through Scripture, maybe the gifts aren't necessary anymore. Maybe they've ceased. It's a version called cessationism. The gifts have ceased and are no longer for today. So that's one of the extreme ways that the question get an- gets answered is, We don't see or experience them or have to do much about them because they aren't real uh, to experience anymore today. On the other extreme would be what we might call Pentecostalism, which is about the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. And denominations that identify that way or churches that identify that way would say, this is something that should be super active and present in all of our gatherings. And so everywhere we go, we should be seeing the spiritual gifts on display. I went to a Bible college that was a Pentecostal Bible college, and so we had chapel every day, which meant every day when I went to chapel, the assumption was that the spiritual gifts would be present. And so people would speak in tongues, or people would get up in the middle of the service to prophesy, or things like that. And then the question always was, was that real? Did it happen the way it was supposed to? Are we comfortable with that? What's going on here? And the caricature of that can be not just that the understanding is that the spirit would show up but that people start to plan and potentially manipulate how those things would show up and be expressed when that would happen there was always an experience that I was thankful for it was actually a man his name was Dan Call he was one of the vice presidents of the school and if if it clearly something had taken place where as a student body or as the teachers everybody's kind of looking around going okay so was that from God or was that just a person manipulating something what took place here often the thing that would take place in the room is Dan Call would get up and he would grab the microphone And one of the things that I appreciated was every time I saw Dan Call get up and gather the microphone what I knew would come from that was clarity Like Paul starts in this letter where he's saying, I just want you to be informed. In those situations, Dan Call would get up and he would explain what just happened and his best understanding of if it was happening biblically or not and what the right response was. And so I can remember a chapel service where somebody had wandered in off the street. By look, I would have assumed they were homeless. I don't know that. I didn't have conversation with them. They walked in off the street, and halfway through the sermon that was taking place, they stood up in the middle of the chairs and began to just tell everyone that was listening what they thought God was saying through them. And as that interrupted and distracted from what was taking place, we all were kind of staring, going, oh, this is interesting. I wonder who's going to respond and how. So some of the staff had come, and they had started talking to the man. They took him out of the service, and then... As I had seen happen before, Dan Call, vice president, he wasn't the one preaching, but he got up and he took the microphone. He said, here's what just took place. This man professed to be speaking on behalf of God as if he had a word of knowledge or prophecy for us. And here's what the Bible says would need to be true for us to believe that that was the gift working through him. And if it's not true, and they didn't believe it to be true, our assumption was that we were supposed to stop it. And, And he just would provide clarity. He would do the same when I saw powerful acts of prophecy happen, and they did decide it was from God. And I was thankful every time that he would get up and talk about what the Bible said, how the Bible encourages us to respond, what's appropriate in those moments. As our denomination has uh, formed positions and understandings and interpretations of Scripture on this thing, we fall in this understanding where we believe the gifts of the Spirit are still for today. We believe they happen as God would choose them to happen, that when they happen, they're for the building up of the body and for the common good and for glorifying God. We also believe they should happen biblically. So when they happen, my hope is always that we would respond with a clarity based on God's word and revelation of how these gifts practice and what their function is. Over the course of the next couple of weeks, we'll end up getting far more detailed about this because Paul will get 
far more detailed about what the practical implications of some of these gifts are within a church worship setting. And when we get there in two weeks, we'll talk about that. That's not primarily where we're going to get to today, though, because it's not how Paul starts his, his information that he's giving. As he continues, verse 11, he just says, all of these, that list of gifts, all of these are the work of the one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. The person who may get a word of prophecy, or tongues, or be used in a healing isn't more righteous. It's just how the Spirit has determined it, and it's always for the common good. If I can say anything clearly, let us remind, be reminded, spiritual gifts are not a talent show where we decide who is most spiritual or gifted or not. And the comparison game is always a trap. Don't let your thoughts assume that's what's true. Don't let our church become a place where we assume that's what's true. They're given as the Spirit determines and for the common good. And as he's explaining that, Paul then wants to use an analogy. He wants to make that clear, not the clarity about the spiritual gifts. He'll get more into that in, in a little bit. But he wants to make clear that we don't misunderstand what weakness and strength spiritually look like in a community together. So he uses an analogy that should be familiar to most of us. He talks about a body. And I say familiar to most of us because we all have a body. And so he continues, just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. He'll end up making this application to the local church, but he starts it with a reminder not just that we're all parts of the body of the church, we're parts of the body of Christ. We're all a part of the body of Christ. He continues, for we were all baptized by one spirit as so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. There are lots of different parts to our body. They form a lot of different role, functions and roles for us. Our hands and our feet do different things. Our head and our lungs do different things. We need all of the parts of the body some of them we don't feel like we need as often. Some of them we overlook their value at times, but all of them are necessary. He explains that out. It won't come up on the screen, but he goes on to say things like, if the foot should say, I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, I'm not an eye, so I don't belong to the body, it wouldn't stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? And where if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. He celebrates the fact that there are lots of different ways that we function and that we play different roles. He says that's true in the body of Christ. We don't all do the same thing. and We don't need to all do the same thing. We need diversity in the body. Explaining it even more in depth, he'll say, I cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. The parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with more honor, and the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. Presentable parts need no special treatment. God's put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. He says, every part of your body matters. Often we don't notice this until part of it isn't functioning the way it's supposed to. Maybe it's been God's grace to me or maybe it's my own clumsiness, but I've been able to learn this lesson a number of times. I've broken fingers, I've broken toes, I've broken arms, I've broken collarbones, I've dislocated shoulders, I've separated shoulders, I've sprained ankles, I've had an Achilles tear all the way through. And every time you thought, I didn't notice how much that body part mattered until it didn't function anymore. Seven years ago in my Achilles tour, I couldn't walk myself to my car to drive myself to the hospital. Because it turns out it's a pretty indispensable part of the body when it comes to walking and moving and controlling your foot. We find these things to be true, that these things matter. Paul's going to go on to say these things matter in the church. We may see some of the things more clearly as people are on stage to preach or teach or to lead in worship. 
lead small groups or things like that, but all of the things matter. Some of those look more behind the scenes, like the people that are running tech, the people that are doing our books, the people that work on our facilities, the people that pray, people that are working with our kids or setting up our cafe. Some of them may be more seen, but they all matter. And Paul says even those ones that seem weak or seem behind the scenes, God gives more honor to those. More honor to those. So that they'd be recognized that way. He goes on, he goes on to give application around that. As he's finishing that statement in verse 25, he just says, So there should be no division in the body, but its parts should have equal concern for each other. Every part matters. This, is, this isn't a talent show where we look at the people who may have been, done the healing or the word of knowledge or the prophecy thing and say, they're the ones doing the important spiritual work. They must have arrived. Paul says, no, that's not the way it works out. All of the things matter. Whether they're the charismatic gifts or the administrative gifts or the hospitality gifts or my favorite because it's the first one in Scripture. It's also one I don't have, but the craftsmanship gift It's the first gift of the Spirit given in Scripture. It shows up in the book of Exodus. It says two men, as they were getting ready to make the tabernacle, were gifted by the Spirit of God to do works with the wood and gold and bronze that were needed for the tabernacle. It was a gift of the Spirit. This is all of those given by God, and there shouldn't be division about who has which ones. In fact, he goes on to say, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. And if one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. We don't get jealous that the gift showed up in someone else. We celebrate and rejoice that the Spirit of God is moving in us as a community together and that it's on display. That's what's supposed to happen. That's the way it's supposed to play out. And as Paul's reminding them of that, he's informing them of that, he just clarifies for them, now you, you are the body of Christ Each one of you is a part of it. You may at times feel like your role is weak. That God God says, I give you more honor for that. Or feel like it isn't as presentable. God says, that's okay. Some of them are covered. Some of them are put on display. That's okay. This is God placed in the first church of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have the gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret? And the answer is no. There isn't one gift we all need to have. There isn't the one gift that's the most important one. We need to celebrate the diversity of gifts. They're given as the Spirit desires and for the common good. And then he says, a phrase that can sound strange after everything else he said, now eagerly desire the greater gifts. Like in the midst of saying they all matter, they're all important, they're all equal, God loves all of them, we shouldn't divide over them, he says, but desire the greater ones. And he's going to eventually give some understanding of the greater ones. He's going to prioritize some of the gifts and put some order to them. It's not going to happen in what we're covering today. It doesn't happen in this chapter. It doesn't even happen in what we'll cover next week because Paul is going to take a tangent to talk about something else before getting back to some of the communal worship gifts and what some of the ways they should play out is. And when we get there, we'll deal with them. Hopefully we'll deal with them the way Paul says, where we look for being informed with clarity and calmness based on what the word of God says. But he gives this understanding That the spiritual gifts happen as the Spirit chooses, but that we get to ask for them. We get to approach God and request them. We get to seek them. We get to desire them, not for comparative sake and not to awry, for God's glory and for the common good. Desire the greater gifts. Before he gets to those, he gives a transitional statement. It ends the chapter this way. He says, and yet, I will show you the most excellent way. 
And in the midst of the corporate church gathered, in the midst of understanding the spiritual gifts, in the midst of hierarchies of what gifts are greater and what gifts are lesser and what benefits the body the most, Paul's going to pause before answering any of that or giving clarity of any of that. And he's going to say what he gives in this text as the most excellent way. We'll talk about it all of next week. But the most excellent way is simple. The most excellent way is love. The gifts don't matter without it. It doesn't matter what you're able to express or how the Spirit of God has shown up. If you can't do it with love, if you've done it as a spiritual soloist, if you think it's just a talent show, and you're not doing it out of love for God and for the common good, you're missing it. That's the most excellent way. Paul's hope is that we would be informed. We'd be informed first and foremost that the Spirit of God just gives the gifts as he determines. He gives them to everyone as he determines and for the common good. And that as we respond to that, the first response is to be able to seek the greater gifts, but to upright everything we do out of love. Some of you are thinking, that doesn't answer most of my uneasy questions yet. I'm aware of that. We have a couple of more weeks where we'll continue talking about spiritual gifts. My hope is always that we wouldn't just see the things Paul is saying or that Scripture is saying and say, okay, that makes sense, and we'll just look forward to what's coming in the next couple of weeks, hoping that's where the application is found, but that every time we look and engage with God's Word, that there's something He may do in us or through us as a part of that. And so I want to give you some opportunities. If God isn't clearly giving you a way that you need to respond to this message, I want to offer some suggestions. I'll offer three of them, one over each of our core values. The first, if you want to connect with someone else while applying this message, I'd encourage you this week, share your experiences or your questions about spiritual gifts with others. You can do so in a way that they may be lots of questions of unease, but the conversation doesn't have to be uneasy. You can just say, man, I have lots of questions. I had this experience that I don't know how There was nobody that took a microphone and gave the calm, clear, biblical instruction afterwards. And so I still just have these questions. That's fine. Let's just start having the conversation so that we can all be informed well. And maybe you'll do that while connecting with others. If you're looking to grow in your relationship with God and your understanding of what he's revealed, I'd encourage you this week um, to just search for the spiritual gifts in Scripture. I think the best way to do this is to just do a word study. Go to somewhere like Bible Gateway, type in the word spirit. It'll show you the 600 verses that use that word. And you'll pretty easily be able to navigate when that that word is used in Scripture, when it is accompanied by uh, that manifesting in humanity somehow. Like the spirit gave the gift of craftsmanship to people in Exodus. And just... Study what the Spirit does and how he manifests in people, what kinds of gifts he provides. There's a couple of them that list them. There's a couple of them that just show up once or twice. The Spirit shows up and manifests in lots of ways, and maybe you'll want to study and grow in your understanding of that. The third and the last is to participate in what God is doing in your life or in the world around you. And that, that I think, is to do so with, with something that our denomination has landed on. As a denomination, we've got positions on a number of the ways we interpret scripture. And as it comes to the uh, spiritual gifts, our denomination has a statement it uses to describe our position. We are not cessationists. We believe the gifts still happen today, but we don't like seeing gifts manipulated. And so we don't go, we, we have a statement that is hopefully helping us prevent against that. The statement that our denomination uses is to show up with expectation, but no agenda. When we gather to worship, show up with an expectation that the Spirit of God is here with us. And that as he would choose to use the gifts for our common good, they'll show up. And we can expect that. We can look for it. We can seek it. But we don't agenda it. We don't plan the order of service where I say, cool, and after that song, invite everybody that wants to to speak in tongues. There's no agenda around it. We don't determine it. It's as the Spirit determines As you want to participate in what God is doing this week, I'd encourage you to come to your whole week with that posture. Whatever it is that you're going through, expect that the Spirit will be there and will provide for the common good, for God's glory and for the common good, and begin to use your language that way. 
pray that way. Pray for the Spirit's gifts to show up and to manifest for the common good. Encourage others that way. If you see them operate in one of the spiritual gifts, even if it's not one that you was on Paul's charismatic list, if you see somebody gifted at craftsmanship, talk about that as a spiritual gift. If you see somebody really hospitable, really loving, engage with that in language and encouragement about that as a spiritual gift without elitism and without comparison, not as a talent show, just use your language with expectant understanding that the Spirit of God is present and active. And as we do so, I think what we'll find is an ability to get through some of the uneasiness that manipulations of spiritual gifts have felt like at times and get to just a confident understanding of what the Word of God says and how the Spirit of God moves. And we'll explore then further together more of those details over the course of the next couple of weeks. I want to pray that we would see how the Spirit of God is active and engage with that at every chance possible. And I'm hopeful that you'll join me in that prayer. God, I am thankful. Thankful for your clarity through Paul and through Scripture that show us the way you long to indwell us, not just with the Spirit that saves us, but that works with power in and through us. And so I pray we would respond well in obedience to that life of the Spirit. I pray as we do so, we would do so without comparison, without feeling like it's a ladder of success spiritually or a talent show that's taking place, but that we would always have a heart and a spirit that recognizes it's for your glory and for our good. That we would celebrate when it's happening more than we are envious that it's happening. That we would always test it with what your word says that we would treat these things as you plan for them and desire them to be seen and used for your kingdom's benefit. So we pray that, that we would respond well. We also pray for your gifts. We seek and desire them. We long for your presence to manifest in and through us in whatever ways you would choose. Particularly, we ask for those greater gifts to be on display for the benefit of your name in your kingdom. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you go, a couple of reminders. If you are in the room and you are motherly, we have uh, candy bars for you. We'd encourage you to take one. If you, as you are leaving, are thinking as a mom, I don't just want to be celebrated. I want to do this mothering thing as well as I know how. And you'd like more information about connecting with other moms in prayer or just the resources they make to do that in your own home, there's a table in the lobby that you can stop by and there'll be some moms there that can help you navigate what some of that may look like in your life as well. As you go, I hope you go with grace and peace. Thanks for worshiping with us this morning.